So good morning. It's a um, 14th of December already. And um, you're in uh, mass media and culture class, um, lecture number 13, believe it or not. Uh, today, we're going to talk about art. Text, letters, memory shapes the present. That's a title I gave to it when I was, before I thought about preparing what I was going to prepare. Um, and, but yeah, memory is a big thing, and text and letters, but the drilling is getting closer. I swear, only on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays when I've got classes. Um, anyway, I want to talk about a few things. Memory, text of memory and history, I suppose. Well, I'm going to talk about art and artists and the world of artists, but university appreciation of art is peculiar. And I, I want to try and get to why. What it is it, what is it that when we focus on knowledge in the university or in culture in general, we have a, and, and, and I'm going to use art as the example, but not only, we actually forget a whole lot of things about social life and history and, and how we are in the world. Uh, and, and that's part of the ideology, um, the, the propaganda, idea, in that sense, ideology of, of global commodity culture these days, the sort of thing that... Adorno would have us remember. Um, so I want to tell some stories about art and about um, Marx and about slavery and, and try and think a bit more um, comparatively about interpretation um, and maybe about the dialectic of interpretation and evaluation and history and memory. Because I think there are some texts worth remembering and they shape and determine our scholarship and context and we do well not to forget. Although memory is, of course, unreliable and the urgency of, you know, doing this task, doing this task now, uh, maybe means we focus on, it's very on specifics rather than see the big picture. And art can be that too. Running over the same old ground, we found same old fears. Well, let's get the slogans, right? So the slogan, the, 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 the cliche, I suppose, um, I want to look at first. In art, art after the internet, art after a hundred years of critique of representation from the surrealists onwards or data onwards or something that, through abstraction, through the situationists and right up to uh, uh, Duchamp and urinal uh, or the banana paint pasted to a wall, stuck to a wall, which somebody came in eight, right? And that was part of the art project. Right? Um, I want to talk about Anthony Gormley and his project, and Michael Landy, who I've talked about before, actually. Uh, a few things that I've talked about will come up before, will come up today. So I'm doing a remix, but also conceptual art, right? So I used to work in a college now in a lot of strife, but I used to work in a college where conceptual art was the big thing. So artists didn't paint, they didn't make sculptures, um, they just had an idea and, and the manifestation of the idea was their art. Uh, that's what made them an artist. And um, we got into this, the reading that I said to you uh, for this week kind of relates to that the question of who is an artist? Uh, amateurism versus the trajectory of the artists who become famous uh, and and I suppose in some ways it was a criticism of um, the subjective self evaluation or, or ego importance of those that called themselves artists in the sense of art in a gallery art in an art magazine as opposed to the many hundreds of other artists who we have to call them artists, but who were just painting by numbers at home, you know, just had as, as a hobby. And you know what Adorno says about hobbies, like he is offended by the idea that you know, he might not take the things that he does for pleasure as seriously as he does work. But you know, an artist who 
who uh, allegedly is going to make money from their art. Not that many do, actually. It's it's not a path to riches that um, may be the mythology of becoming an artist. Well, this part part of the mythology of becoming an artist is you've got to live in a suffer in a gar garret and, and cut off your ear and all, all sorts of things like that. On the other hand, you also have this, you'll become one day famous. And so, but actually, most people making art are uh, doing watercolors at home or, or, or coloring in, kids coloring in, or, or yeah, um, that, that concept of artist breaks down a little bit. And it did, at the same time, conceptual art broke down the concept of being an artist. So, so there were events like um, someone turning a light on and off got into the Turner Prize and um, so on. An unmade bed was exhibited in a Tate Gallery. Uh, an artist's unmade bed, of course, because it was not just any unmade bed. But that was the point, actually. It was any unmade bed, but because it was called art, it became. Anyway, an artist can conceptually do that, especially after the YBA's Young British Artists Movement in the 90s in England, this sort of thing. All right, after the internet, this kind of reference to becoming famous was, was more the individual and, and their subjective uh, persona in the media. And I guess I want to get us to think critically about that, about how there's this mass ideology of selfishness in, uh, in the media world versus, I don't know, the collective or, or the party or, or, or the necessary influence of, of others on what we do, how what we do is only what we, whoever we are whether it be an artist or a lecturer or a writer or uh, uh, just Joe or Jane Bloggs, Jane Wynn, whatever, is an individual. Even though we have an ideology of individualism and ego, really there is a whole lot of things we should not forget to make it possible just to be. And so because I talked about Marx a lot last week and, and Engels and the working day, uh, I'm kind of continuing, going to continue in the second half or, or in, in the latter part of this lecture to talk about Marx and, and, and this question, individual versus collective uh, and egotism and slavery. Because right? uh, I think the master discourse uh, has a bad memory. We continually forget how much everyday interests, what gets into the media, is based on a whole lot of things that we maybe shouldn't ought to forget quite so easily. So anyway, um, one way into starting this discussion is to talk about high concept art. So in London, in Trafalgar Square, outside the National Gallery, as you see in this picture, there is a concrete plinth in one corner of the Trafalgar Square. There are four plinths actually, but in the other uh, three plinths, there are old statues of Britain's colonial imperial heroes, right? So there's, there's Nelson in the middle on top of a tower. Um, and then in the, in the four corners, there's like kings and explorers and, and, and so on, right? But there's, an empty plinth because it was reserved, it was planned to be for someone who fell out of favour and it was never, um, they never decided on whose statue, like someone riding on a horse who was supposed to be, uh, would, would be put up there. And then horses went out of fashion as well and, and they didn't put someone on a motorcycle. Um, this plinth remained empty, waiting for someone to decide who it would be. Right? Um, and there were all sorts of proposals, but the, the committee uh, couldn't decide. So there's this empty plinth. Um, I forget what the other three plinths contain. They're generals and colonial heroes, imperial empire heroes. Right? Um, 
generals and soldiers and so on. This empty one, though, because it was the closest one to the National Gallery, became a site for um, a lot of interest. Of course, who would who would put a statue on top of there? But then the um, art movement managed to to come up with a proposal that really grabbed attention, and it was that there would be an award, a competition that would then have a temporary sculpture put on the fourth plinth. It would be modern art, modern-ish art, I suppose. It wasn't too risky. It was still a civic space in London and run by some pretty conservative people, the competition. Anyway, it would, would um, manifest some recent art uh, artist's work uh, for like a, a period of, of, of a year or something. I think it was actually longer than that. I think it was 16 months or something, and then two months to prepare. So every year and a half. Um, so they did this maybe 20 years ago now. Um, I, I don't know whether it was the first, but a very early one was Inca um ship in a bottle was put on top of the plinth. You can see it here. Uh, it's a different angle on the plinth, but there's still the gallery is there behind it, with the dome building, and then the tower of... Um, St. Francis in the Fields Church. I think that's St. Francis in the Fields Church. And uh, the um, Inca Schoenberg piece is a kind of commentary on um, British maritime power and colonialism and, and, and so on. Um, still exists. This is on a plinth now outside the Maritime Gallery in Greenwich. And it's, a, it's a great piece. It's, it's a, so this thing is huge, right? So this is um, bigger than a, a, a person in height. So you know, maybe it's ten feet in height, maybe more even. And it's 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 installed on this plinth that you you can't climb up to get to. It's it's um, out of reach. But yeah, it's it's in a very prominent place in the middle of the city, and so it's it's high exposure for an artist. So to to get this commission. Well, to win the competition, you have to do make a model, and then uh, it goes to a judging panel. They did for a little while have a public um, a vote alongside the the judges panel, but they didn't agree. So, but anyway, um, another one was this blue cockerel. I guess it's a, a reference to France. Uh, maybe this was after the French football team had won the soccer World Cup or something. Anyway, it's another angle on the square. You can see there um, Nelson's column in the background. The foreground is the plinth and the square and the fountains. This, this site, uh, this Trafalgar Square, is, is a, a famous as a part of central London, right? Everyone who, who visits goes there. Um, every protest pretty much that's ever been that goes anywhere near the Parliament building uh, ends up there. Um, I've been caught up in, in police actions in that square with thousands of people many times uh, where you get surrounded by the police and locked in the square for hours, kettled, or it's where the peace marches, uh, the anti-Vietnam War marches, they all ended up here because it's a, a ideal place for setting up a stage and, and having thousands of people contained in a in an amphitheater type space uh, in the middle of the city surrounded by these very picturesque buildings. The second picture you see there is uh, another kind of winged bird, but this is a uh, uh, Abyssinian reference. Um, right, so going back, what? Abyssinia, 4,000, 3,000 years, something like that, um, to, to the civilization of uh, the Sumerian, well, no, the, uh, what is now Iraq, right? Abyssinia was before. Um, and so, yeah, this, this uh, plinth carries on a rotating basis various artists, and, and as I said, there's a competition. My cousin Sakari was one of the finalists for one where she made a model of uh, protesters going to the 
um, that space, Trafalgar Square. And in fact, that's modeled. Uh, I took her to the demonstration, um, modeled on our experience at, at a demonstration. It didn't win. It won the public vote, but it didn't win the um, decision by the, the committee to put out there. But I wanted to include it just to um, nod to Sukari, my cousin by marriage, um, because it's, it, was, it was potentially the most relevant work to, to make that plinth uh, because the square is for the people, not uh, it's a place where there are pro political protests uh, and speeches and, and it's a very public demonstrative, it's a space of demonstrations um, to then represent that back uh, as art on the plinth, as a monument in a monumental form. Um, it was a great idea, I thought. Uh, uh, of course, it, it wasn't accepted. Um, although, uh, uh, two years later, I think, Anthony Gormley's um, done something similar where he put together a thing called uh, One and Other, um, where living people were the sculpture. Right? So some netting was put up around the plinth and individuals were put, living in beings were put in the space of the sculpture. And they, over a period of a year, I think between, I can't remember the hours, but most of the day, um, you got one or two hour blocks of time and individuals could do anything they liked, within reason, I suppose, um, to, to, on, on this plinth. And people spoke, people dressed as you no know, uh, uh, cosplay characters. Um, they, they protested various niche issues. Uh, they read poetry, they read Shakespeare, they dressed and undressed, and, and uh, some just read a book, um, some sunbathed, some smoked a cigar. Um, it was really. Um, interesting because at the level at one level it was anyone could have applied to become uh, a person on the plinth and anthony gormley was the curator of, of this um work of art which was very conceptual right um yeah. gormley is really interesting as a artist because he's he's, got a, he's pretty establishment he's pretty mainstream and yet uh what he does i think is kind of provocative, a bit egocentric. Um, his most famous piece is The Angel of the North and, and uh, um, see the Sentinels. Um, he, he makes sculptures, I guess, casts of his own body. His, his, his body made, uh, made, he makes, well, well, one project he made anyway that I thought was really uh, significant psychologically, politically, conceptually. Um, was this uh, Sentinel project where he, he, I don't know whether it was called that, but um, he made casts of exactly his body and staring out and he put them on the top of various buildings throughout the city of London. And it was a bit eerie because there were these figures um, and he'd, he'd done a similar thing in a beach up north where they, they, they were out into the surf just staring out at the horizon. And then in the city, these figures, Gormleys, cast Gormleys, were staring out at the city, watching, watching, watching. Like, it was a bit eerie. And so that was yeah, kind of a different monument because it wasn't like Nelson there on his tower, um, who's just so high up you can't even see. Uh, see. These were still high up, but... Uh, you could get different angles on them and, and see these people. And in a way, putting live people on top of the plinth was similar because as much as you see the, the people in the square, they looked up occasionally and looked at the people. It was as much as, as the, the people on the plinth getting to look at passers-by in the square from a different angle, from an angle you, you don't really get to see. I mean, they would watch... The audience and look for the whole thing was about getting a response 
No, it was, it was pretty interesting. I actually interviewed Gormley, the Institute of Contemporary Art, um, back in the day. I don't know whether this will play. Yeah, it will. Okay. Let me know if the sound kills it or not. Is it playing? So I'm going to assume that we, we, we know we're here for the fourth plan, uh, talk series and uh, Anthony was the how do you describe your role as the curator of an event called One Another? Instigator. The instigator. Yeah. Provocator, <laughs> I would prefer. Um, yeah. So it's not working in the slides. So it should. Hmm. All right. You can see it. Why isn't it playing? It's the curator of an event. Um, and there's lots of things we, we can... Every time I move out of it, it stops working. Who's written into... Yeah. All right, so I'm going to just recommend that you look this up. Um, that's okay. It's a conversation between, um, yeah, Gormley and mostly it's Gormley talking, so it's quite good. And the Institute of Contemporary Arts, I don't know when this was. Um, I wonder if I can find out for you. I can't remember when it was. 2013, 10, eight years ago. See, I've never had hair. <laughs> um, now I want to get out of this. All right, I, I talk. I, I move on to another conceptual artist. So you can, you can. I'll put the link to um, Gormley talking about art and and individuality, which is really the topic for today, on the um, e-learning. Uh, I, I think he's really interesting. He's very, he's taken to be this superpower artist, but he's quite a modest guy. And he was taken around as they were setting up a retrospective of his work in the um, Hayward Gallery once. And, and they were busy, everyone was busy moving his sculptures into place and so on. And, and he was showing us around. And then we're in this big room. And over the far side of the room, we heard a kind of a crash and then complete silence. And basically, someone had dropped one of the works and broken a piece off, and they were panicked, right? They'd broken a piece of the sculpture, and the artist is in the room. He's going to be upset, isn't he? So they're all sort of like, what are we going to do? And um, he just walked along and went, oh, yeah, that's broken off. We got a welder that they were using to, to put the things in place and just welded the piece back on and went, yeah, that'll be all right, and, and went off. I mean, this very... Uh, you know, matter of fact and humble. And, I mean, obviously, he's also not because he's got a, pers a public persona, uh, the artist, and, and the artist produces books and, and has talks. And, and um, it's, it's interesting that very often the public person in the media, someone like an artist, is very different to how they are in, in so-called real life. I wonder if that's true of uh, another guy, Michael Landy, who I want to talk about, um, his project Breakdown. I've possibly spoken to some of you before about this. I want to um, mention this. First of all, I want to put it in the context of just... So this is a photograph from Afghanistan when the US were dropping cluster bombs on the people of Afghanistan. They're yellow phosphorus bombs that explode and the, the, the phosphorus is yellow as well and if it gets on your skin it burns through the bone. At the same time and in the same colour they dropped aid packages 
So Afghans were scrambling around for these aid packages that have been dropped upon areas, uh, potentially in the same fields where they where there were cluster bombs, that same color. It was just an irony. Anyway, this this I wanted to include that as kind of a hint at the memory of context, because at the same time that Landy was doing his breakdown project with a yellow color scheme. Um, Afghanistan was being uh, bombed, so right? this is going back 20 years now. Um, yeah, just on 20 years. So Landy's project, for those of you that know about it already, um, he hired a shop in Oxford Street in the centre of London and uh, hired some people to um, collect all of his possessions, everything he owned in the world, and um, grind them up into dust, into fragments. So they were put through a machine, including his car, was disassembled, taken apart into smaller and smaller bits, and then ground. Obviously, uh, it was easier with the plastic bits and the wooden bits than the metal bits, but ground into a kind of dust and thrown away. Everything he owned, including um, pieces of art that other people had given him, um, things his girlfriend, former wife, I'm not sure, had given him, um, his passport, um, notebooks, um, what have we got here, uh, catalogues from his art show, a toilet plunger, a lamp, um, various commodities turned into nothing into dust and the dust wasn't even um, like it wasn't re-commodified. You can imagine that someone doing an art project like this, breaking down all their stuff, uh, would, would then have the stuff left and sell it in little sachets or something, you know, the dust of someone's life maybe, but it didn't even re-commodify it. It was just thrown away. Someone's entire life's possessions, all the commodities they ever they owned up until that point, including his shirts, right? He then bought a kind of cheap set of uh, shirts for the project. And when it was finished, he, all he had was these cheap shirts that he, and, and shorts that he'd bought during a, a kind of blue jumpsuit type thing. Everything else was destroyed from his life. And that was the whole idea is conceptual art, right? Many people came to look at this. It was significant as an event, but it also and it was... A, pretty egotistic in a way, um, there was much criticism of him for this because he was destroying presents that people had given him. They, they said, that's selfish to use these things that I gave you, uh, you know, intimate tokens of our life just to make yourself a famous artist. Um, did make him a famous artist. Uh, it questions the... Like he, he didn't really know exactly what he was he was doing, but he was doing it to raise questions about who he was. Um, was he all of his things? Can you imagine doing that? Like, my God, the amount of books I would never want to destroy. Um, it was to to question who he was and 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 well, what a person was. What ego attachment we had to things. It was a commentary on commodification of our lives. Um, that he put it in a kind of conveyor belt was was like an, a, a commentary on, on our contemporary culture being more industrialized, our identities industrialized, we are what we own. Um, it was powerful in that respect. So this is why I think um, both, both Gormley um, and his project of individuals on the um, plinth, what is an artwork and, and who are the people, but, but also including Sakari Douglas Camp's um, possible project for that plinth, as well as Landy's breakdown, really raise interesting questions about who we are in contemporary mass society, commodity culture, you know, are we these things, are we, uh, but it, it didn't, at the same time, it didn't problematize uh, 
the process of becoming a famous artist uh, that that was taken for granted that there was a controlling consciousness uh, the artist who was making this set of questions emerge this conceptual performance if you like and that artist was an individual even though the individual could be um, turned into uh, uh, um, many individuals representing the one individual being the art or a individual who was stripped naked literally uh, from all of their possessions now my argument and thing for us to consider for for the class today is is whether or not that doesn't forget a whole lot of things that make make it possible for starters all of his things had to be made by someone right that's the basic argument of of commodity culture isn't it marx's point uh in in commodity fetish in the first chapter of capital is that uh, these these things these commodities that, that seem to be related to each other by price and and seem to have a life of their own uh actually are congealed social relations between the people that made them and, and even even to destroy uh landy's commodities he needed other people it had to be uh not just an audience to watch him do it he wouldn't have done it without an audience no doubt um but it had to it relied on other people and and to make the machines that did the destroying uh, also to have built the room in which it was destroyed to have set up the conveyor belt to to have, and and of course to have made all the commodities right that's a basic point but maybe there's something wider here now i want to read some of um marx's capital with you on this and kind of try and use it to complicate this question of what is an individual as an artist and just as a concept of individual so this is from chapter 16 um, chapter 16 of of volume one of capital and it's something that i think many people miss when they read capital it's that so sure Marx starts off talking about an individual laborer and a relationship between you know a Robinson um, in isolation and commodities but he doesn't stick to that model of labor that the labor theory of value is not about an individual laborer that's where you start the argument but by the time he gets to chapter 16 as we can see things change so in considering the labor process we began chapter five and so on by treating it in abstract apart from its historical forms as a process between man and nature we stated there use the pages if we examine the whole labor process from the point of view of its result it's plain that both the instruments and the subject of labor are means of production and the labor itself is productive labor and in note seven, same page, we further added the method of determining from the standpoint of the labor process alone what is, a product, what is productive labor is no means directly applicable to the case of capitalist process of production. We now proceed to the further development of this subject. This is actually a much overlooked and, and crucial move on Marx's part, right? He's saying that the beginning of capital isn't really about the capitalist process of production. It's a conceptual development that allows us to think about the labor process on its own, but not capitalist labor yet. So far as the labor process is purely individual, one and the same laborer unites in himself, herself, all the functions that later on became separated. Okay, so we're going to talk about the division of labor, but one person produces like in this idealized model the same laborer unites in themselves all the functions that later on become separated when an individual appropriates natural objects for their livelihood no one controls them but themselves afterwards he is controlled by others when there's a division of laborer labor and then some labors are controlled by others a single worker 
cannot operate upon nature without calling on their own muscles um, and uh, under the control of their own brain. But the natural body, head and hand, they wait upon each other. So also in the labor process, there's a unity of labor of the hand with that of the head. Later on, they part company and even become deadly foes. The product ceases to be the direct product of the individual and becomes a social product. All right, so in making things in this ideal early form, one person does the whole process. Okay, I'm going to, I don't know, get this stick and carve it into a um, implement for uh, scratching in the dirt to grow vegetables or something, right? I'm going to put the seeds in, I'm going to cover the dirt, I'm going to water it. Right? Eventually then, in division of labour, it comes to the point where somebody is telling you, using their head, telling you to you know, dig in that field, use that stick, use that hoe to, to plant some crops and, you know, okay, a social product. And that can, can be done collectively in a way that's, that's fair and shared. You farm for the community or it's done in a hierarchical way, right? Uh, a social product produced in common by the collective labourer, by the combination of work workers, each of whom takes only a part, greater or less, in the manipulation of the subject of their labour. So in a farming situation, someone does the watering, someone does the digging, someone does the gathering. It doesn't all have to be the same person. The labour can be different. Right? As the cooperative character of our labor process becomes more and more marked, so as necessary consequences, our notion of the productive of productive labor and of its agent, the productive laborer. So here's the key. The productive laborer, the one who does the work, produces value, becomes, after the division of labor, extended beyond the individual. In order to labour productively, it's no longer necessary then for you to do manual work yourself. You might be enough. You, you might be an organ of the collective labourer. You might be the one that tells other people to work. You might be the one that coordinates the work. Right? So long as you're the organ of the collective labourer and perform one of the subordinate functions of the whole of the labour that goes into farming the fields. The first definition of the productive labourer, a, a definition deduced from the nature of production of material objects, still remains correct for the collective labourer, right? but considered as a whole. But it does not long, any longer hold in this model for the individual labour, each member taken individually. Each member does not produce something of value themselves. They are a part of a collective process of production. Okay. This is a major change in chapter 16 in Capital. On the other hand, however, our collective notion of productive labor becomes also narrower. Capitalist production is not, so that was expanding it. The, the, the collective labor means expanding the notion of, of production. But capitalist production is not merely the production of commodities, it's essentially the production of surplus value. So really the labourer that produces, that's worthwhile for capital, produces not for himself, themselves, but for capital. It no longer suffices, therefore, that they should simply produce. They must produce surplus value. The labourer alone, that labourer alone, is productive who produces surplus value for the capitalist and thus works for the self-expansion of capital. So you might have collective labour, but it's only worthwhile if the capital invested in that collective labour gets some of those workers to produce a surplus that then can be expropriated, turned into profit through exchange by someone who owns it, okay, who owns the means of production. We may take an example from outside the sphere of production, right? of material objects, a schoolmaster is a productive labourer when in addition to belabouring the heads of his scholars, he works like a horse to enrich the school proprietor. I love this example. Okay, so it may, because it's, it's, it refers to, to what's happening here. 
a teacher in a university does not actually produce anything immediately of material value. And in fact, doesn't produce anything that really can be sold unless you sell the education, right? That's a separate, slightly separate thing. We'll talk about that. By belaboring the heads of the, that, the, the pupils, that increases the capacity of those pupils later to maybe produce surplus value, but it doesn't produce any surplus value immediately. Right? But that work in terms of from the perspective of the collective laborer is productive of value. Like over time, the number of students that then turn into workers at a higher skilled level produce more surplus value because they had that education. Right? So the teacher works like a horse to enrich the school proprietor. The latter lays out his capital, it's money bags, so we can call him male there, in a teaching factory instead of a sausage factory doesn't change things at all. So in the sausage factory, sorry, in the university, my individual labor is not productive. I don't make anything of value unless we sell the education, which we do nowadays. Of course, education is sold as a commodity. You pay your fees, uh, you, you uh, sell education overseas to foreign students, you, uh, you do something, but, but the actual teaching part, improving your skills, right, even just giving you information, but also uh, uh, producing critical thinkers makes you in the future a more productive worker. So while the teacher doesn't produce anything, in combination with the capacities that you have that you know your family also prepared you for and so on through the teaching relation potential labor that you can do is of a higher level and therefore more productive of value than it would otherwise be so my contribution in a kind of secondary way is productive of value no actual value in the in fact, I, I kind of hope actually dysfunctional for capital, teaching you to be critical sort of to undermine some of the worst parts of capital, but no actual value produced immediately, but at, at the individual level, but collectively in terms of the whole process overall, yes, we increase the productive capacity of the collective work of those that are educated. Does that make sense? All right, maybe this one is, is very difficult. So uh, maybe we can get someone to read it in Tinget. Can you see this? Would someone like to read it out? Any volunteer? Hmm? Anyone? Go on then. We don't have a message, but someone put up their hands for volunteers, so please. Um, giá trị thẳng dư tuyệt đối và giá trị thẳng dư tương đối. Trước hết, xem chương 5. Quá trình lao động được nghiên cứu một cách trừu tượng, không phụ thuộc vào các hình thức lịch sử của nó như là một quá trình giữa người và tự nhiên. Ở đây, chúng tôi đã nói, nếu đứng về mặt kết quả của nó, tức là đứng về mặt sản phẩm mà xét toàn bộ quá trình, thì cả tư liệu lao động lẫn đối tượng lao động đều biểu hiện ra từ tư liệu sản xuất. Còn bản thân lao động thì biểu hiện ra là lao động sản xuất. Trong chú thích 7 còn bổ sung, định nghĩa này về lao động sản xuất xét trên quan điểm của một quá trình lao động diễn đơn thì hoàn toàn không đủ nữa đối với quá trình sản xuất tư bản chủ nghĩa. Vấn đề đó ở đây cần được nghiên cứu sâu thêm nữa. Khi quá trình lao động còn là một quá trình thuần túy cá nhân,
thì cũng một công nhân ấy kết hợp tất cả các chức năng mà sau này bị tách riêng ra trong sự chiếm hữu cá nhân những vật thể tự nhiên vì mục đích sống sinh sống của mình người công nhân đó tự mình kiểm kiểm soát lấy mình về sau người đó lại bị kiểm soát một người riêng sẽ không thể tác động đến tự nhiên nếu không vận động các bắp thịt của mình dưới sự kiểm soát của bộ não của mình cũng như hệ thống tự nhiên đầu và tay gắn với nhau thì trong quá trình lao động lao động trí óc và lao động chân tay cũng kết hợp lại với nhau về sau lao động trí óc và lao động chân tay tách rời nhau và đi đến chỗ đối lập một cách thù địch với nhau sản phẩm nói chung đã từ sản phẩm trực tiếp của Sorry, I can't yeah. change I, it either. I can read uh, because um, base at yeah. the bottom. Yeah, I know that's the uh, thing that was put on afterwards. Um, yeah. Let's just skip to the next page and continue. Lab, what was it? Um, come from Sahoy, Tansan. Somebody else? Well, Lynn, this is great. Uh, it's great to hear it actually read, not in my slow reading. Um, okay, so anyone else? Okay, maybe Lynn, you continue. Yes, teacher. Good on you. Sản phẩm chung của người lao động tổng thể tức là một số người lao động kết hợp mà những thành viên của nó đều có tác động hoặc gần hoặc xa đến đối tượng lao động. Vì vậy, cùng với tính chất hợp tác của bản thân, quá trình lao động thì khái niệm lao động sản xuất và người đảm nhiệm đó, tức là người lao động sản xuất, cũng tức yếu mở rộng ra. Muốn lao động sản xuất bây giờ không cần phải trực tiếp mó tay vào nữa, chỉ cần là một khí quan của người lao động tổng thể chỉ cần thực hiện một trong những chức năng nào đó của người ấy là đủ định nghĩa lúc ban đầu nói trên về lao động sản xuất phát ra từ bản chất của chính ngay nền sản xuất vật chất thì đây vẫn còn đúng mãi mãi với người lao động tổng thể coi như một chính thể nhưng định nghĩa đó không còn đúng với mỗi mỗi thành viên xét riêng của người lao động tổng thể ấy nữa nhưng mặt khác khái niệm lao động sản xuất lại thu hẹp lại nền sản xuất tư bản chủ nghĩa không chỉ sản xuất hàng hóa mà về thực chất là sản xuất ra giá trị thẳng dư người công nhân không phải sản xuất cho mình mà cho tư bản vì vậy không còn đủ nữa nếu như anh ta chỉ sản xuất nói chung anh ta cần phải sản xuất ra giá trị thẳng dư chỉ có người lao động nào sản xuất ra giá trị thẳng dư cho nhà tư bản hoặc phục vụ cho tư bản tự tăng thêm giá trị thì mới được gọi là người lao động sản xuất ví dụ Người thầy giáo, nếu được phép chọn một ví dụ ở ngoài lĩnh vực sản xuất vật chất là một người lao động sản xuất, nếu như người đó không những mở mang đầu óc cho trẻ em mà còn là vì anh ta đã nai lưng ra làm giàu cho nhà kinh doanh. Nhà kinh doanh này bỏ tư bản vào một xưởng dạy học hay bỏ vào một xưởng lạp xưởng, lạp xưởng thì tình hình cũng không thay đổi chút nào. Vì vậy, khái niệm người lao động sản xuất quyết không chỉ bao hàm quan hệ giữa hoạt động và hiệu quả có ích giữa những người công nhân và sản phẩm lao động mà còn bao hàm quan hệ xã hội đặc thù xuất hiện để làm tăng thêm xuất hiện trong lịch sử nó khiến cho người lao động trở thành công cụ trực tiếp để làm tăng thêm tư bản do đó trở thành người lao động sản xuất. So thank you Lynn. that's great so yeah. hopefully that's clear I, I didn't catch um sausage factory there but then that's maybe my my um translation but uh you you get the the drift so marx is writing with with um what's really amazing here is that the thing that so many people who read capital grasp that the worker produces um Uh, commodities and those commodities have a relation in the market but they're really social relations uh, alienated and so on people grasp that they don't then follow up to comprehend that he then has that both as true and not correct for the collective worker that the collective worker is is one where some people might not be producing surplus value 
individually. So it might not be true that surplus value theory works for them at an individual level, but collectively it does. And that's a really important distinction because then where is, where is the location of exploitation? Is it, is it in the individual wage, individual uh, uh, compensation? Is the surplus value extracted by paying that worker less per day than they produce? Or is it paying collectively all the workers, less, which it is, less per day than they collectively produce across whichever level of society? And this is where it then gets really interesting because society requires us not to think like that. So society, mass, mass, mass culture, emphasizes our subjective individual identities, thinks of us, you know, all right. And the critical response to that is, you know, any collective action by a trade union or a political party, whatever is kind of disruptive for the capitalists who just want to think about individual and wage. They don't want to think about collective labor. They don't want us to re recognize that actually we are all in this together. That's their slogan, we're all in this together. But what Marx really means is we really all are. Now, it's very interesting if you think about this in relation to art, but we'll get to that. In the next step after chapter 16, a bit further on, Marx talks, talk, starts to talk about those forms of labor that aren't waged, right? So while so many people think capital is a book about capitalists and workers, it's when he starts to talk about those people that are unemployed that something really interesting happens. So Marx writes with a hint of kind of grim op optimism that as soon as the workers learn the secret of why it happens that the more they work, the more alien wealth they produce, it's expropriated from them, and the more alien wealth they produce, that the more the productivity of their labor increases, the more does the very function of the means for valorization of capital become, become more precarious, right? The more that they produced, the more that they uh, are um, subject to the, the, the whims of, of capital, right? As soon as the workers discover, right, if they've read Capital, they'll discover, right, that the degree of intensity of the competition amongst themselves depends wholly upon the pressure of the relative surplus population. Right? Now, here's, here's the thing. Capital keeps costs of production down by saying to each individual worker, if you don't work for this low amount, we'll find someone else who's quite willing to do it for that amount. Right? And when there is a large surplus population right, of available workers, the unemployed, the workers who have jobs are stuck in a way. They're, they're, so many of us are actually ducking and diving from, uh, uh, in, in precarious conditions because we know if we don't cope with the conditions that we're given, somebody else will, will slot into that position. Now, once we recognize this, once the, the workers in general recognize this, as soon as they set up trade unions to try and organize and plan to cooperate between the employed and the unemployed, that's when uh, they, they want to do that to, to obviate or to weaken the ruinous effects of this natural law of capitalist production on their class. So as soon as they do that, capital and its sycophant political economy cry out against an infringement of the eternal law of supply and demand. You know, supply and demand. There are that many workers and therefore the, the salaries must stay low because there are other workers who will do it. That's supply and demand. But actually the challenge to that and why the cry comes up is that for the from the moment that the unemployed and the employed start to organize together rather than just organizing a trade union but something more political across the whole of society the old order is shaky, is threatened, All right? So the collective worker then in that sense, not the individual worker producing 
a commodity, but the collective worker also must include the unemployed worker. And so and Marx has an argument about this. He calls it the reserved army of labour. And this is a, an absolute crucial part of the argument. Every combination between employed and unemployed disturbs the pure action of the law of supply and demand. Right? As soon as the workers try to organise unionisation between the workers and the unemployed, between the active and the reserve army, right? the reserve army is the unemployed, potential workers, basically. As soon as there's an organisation across both, the economy cries out that it's unfair. On the other hand, as soon as in the colonies, adverse circumstances prevent the creation of an industrial reserve army and with it absolute dependence of the working class upon the capitalist class, capital tries to check its inconvenient action by forcible means and state interference. Right? It, it enforces uh, people to work. Who is the reserve army? Marx breaks it down. You know, he talks about uh, who the reserve army is. There are several sections. There's a floating section of the reserve army. They are people who are not in full employment. They are in sometimes in employment and sometimes not. They're, they're at the edges of full employment. They're um, part-time employed, they're, they're seasonally employed. Um, they have not quite enough work to, to make up a full salary. Um, they're struggling but they are still making an effort right, to, to be employed. And because of them, because they're the ones most immediately who would um, take a full-time job if it was offered, those who have a full-time job are, are kept in place. There's the latent part of the reserve army. They are um, a surplus rural population. Okay? And at certain times, Capital mass, capitalist commodity, commodity production requires more workers. They they call upon the rural to move into the city. The rural workers, the surplus rural workers, move into. We see this a lot with growing economies. I mean, Ho Chi Minh will be an example. Many people from the Mekong Delta area and and so on have immigrated to the city, not just Ho Chi Minh City, Canto, and 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 so on. And put a pressure on on all other workers, right? Because, right, it's not like there's full employment, and they've come because there's there's um, we need extra workers to do full time jobs. They are enticed into work because it's quite useful for corporations to have uh, a kind of threat to contemporary workers. You don't ask for too much in terms of salary increase because, you know, somebody else could do that job. Or, and I think about this in, 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 in Vietnam, this is much less controversial because we have party regulation and a planned economy. Think about it in a completely deregulated economy. London, for example. Precarious work in London, so very hard. And immigration to big capitalist cities whether it be London or, or Paris or, or Bombay or Calcutta, it's, it's massive, part of industrialization. But then there's also another section of the reserve army. Uh, the, the reserve army, they're an army of potential laborers, but they're not in labor, they're stagnant. They're irregular labor or the sub-proletariat, right? The, the lumpenized, um, proletarianized, I don't know, street workers and uh, uh, so on. Right? So there's this range of different types of unemployment or underemployment that are a part of employment. So if, if, we, let, if we thought about it at the level of an individual worker, that doesn't make any sense. You've got an individual worker who has a job, or someone who doesn't have a job, end of the story. But if you think of the collective worker, the individual worker who has a job is conditioned by, in a way, their, their salary is conditioned, their work conditions are shaped by the fact that there are people who are not fully employed, putting pressure on those that are fully employed. So if we were going to map 
the operations of capital. We did quite well to recognize how that text asks us to change our perspective from the individual worker um, as social labor to the collective labor of many social laborers. So not just from the individual labor, labor to the collective, which was the path that we saw last week when we were looking at the working day. Right? Also, the labor of the individual within the collective labor is different. So it might not be that I produce any value, but as part of uh, a system that creates valuable workers in the graduates, absolutely do I contribute to the collective extraction of surplus value. So interpretations of labor theory of value must change according to the level of analysis. That's really crucial. And maybe that distinction should apply when we think about all parts of our calculations of value, including the art world. Now, the point about the collective labor was already made in, in, in the very well-known last words of the manifesto. Workers of the world, you have nothing to lose, but your chains unite. Workers of the world unite. Right? And the chained workers, of course, were, were the slaves. And we talked about this last week as well, right? The, the worker in the, the white skin cannot claim freedom until they recognize that the black has to be no longer insulted or no longer enslaved. And Marx is writing during the American Civil War and, and so on. I mean, actually, I want to get into this. Why does he, he, he think this is uh, important? Right? Um, Lincoln is not the freer of the slave, right? The, the president of America is not necessarily someone you would think of an ally, as an ally in, in uh, the global um, workers of the world unite kind of ideology. But by recognizing that he had to free the slaves in order to win the civil war, there is a role for Lincoln in right, um, making sure that it's not just a sausage factory that is developed. We can read a bit of Marx's letter to, to Lincoln. Right, so this is Marx writing on the part of the International Working Men's Association International Workers Association, it should be. Obviously, women workers were uh, a big deal for Marx. Anyway, he writes as the secretary of the IWMA to Lincoln. Sir, we congratulate the American people upon your re-election, 1963, right? Uh, sorry, 1863, by a large majority. If resistance to the slave power was the reserve watchword of your first election, the triumphant war cry of your re-election is death to slavery. So the slave power is the southern states, the plantation, plantationocracy, the, the, the system of, of um, plantations that meant labor was sold by the life rather than by the hour. From the commencement of the Titanic American strife, the working men of Europe felt instinctively that the star spangled banner carried the destiny of their class. I think Marx there is being a bit ironic. He can't help himself but mock a little bit the Star Spangled Banner. The contest for the territories which opened the dire epogee, epopee, I think that should be epogee, epopee, epop, was not to con decide whether the virgin soil of immense tracts should be wedded to the labor of the immigrant or prostituted to the tramp. Right. The contest for the territories which opened the diagonal, was it not to decide whether the virgin soil of immense tracts should be wedded to the labor of the immigrant or prostituted by the tramp of the slave driver? The tramp of the slave driver. The slave driver was wanting to set up the West in a plantation model. And the North is wanting to set up more and more sausage factories. It's, it's the labor it will still be exploitative, but that's an improvement on slavery. When an oligarchy of 300,000 slaveholders dared to inscribe for the first time in the annals of the world slavery on the banner of the armed revolt, when on the very spots where hardly a century ago the idea of one democratic republic had sprung up, had first sprung up, when the first declaration of the rights of man was issued and the first impulse given to the European revolution of the 18th century, when on those very spots counter-revolution with systematic thoroughness 
gloried in rescinding the ideas entertained at the time of the formation of the old constitution and maintained slavery to be a beneficial institution. Indeed, the old solution of the great problem of the relation of capital to labor and cynically proclaimed property in man, the cornerstone of the new edifice. Then the working classes of Europe understood at once, even before the frenetic partisanship of the upper classes for the Confederate gentry had given its dismal warning, that the slaveholders' rebellion was to sound the toxin for a general holy crusade of property against labor. And the men of labor, with their hopes for the future, even their past conquests were at stake in the tremendous conflict on the other side of the Atlantic. All right. Does the working class in Europe really think like that? I mean, maybe. It's quite uh, an elaborate, fully of, full, of, full of quotations of the, the history of, I suppose, the slow, or the, the progress of workers towards a democratic institution as undermined by those who come with the ideology of slavery, that we can, our, 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 our wealth is our value in human beings, right? Our wealth is our, uh, the individuals we own. Of course, people recognize that as, as really crucial and why the civil war in America was so important worldwide. Everywhere they bore, therefore, patiently the hardships imposed upon them by the cotton crisis. Of course, the cotton crisis, the embargo that was made on the South to stop export of cotton from the slaveholding states to uh, European factories meant that the factories and the workers in the factories in Europe were, were underemployed again. All right, they were made to duck and dive. The thing is, Marx is pointing out these, these systems are completely connected, right? That slavery and its cotton economy was fueling the so-called democratic economy of the Manchester mills. But anyway, while the working men, the true political powers of the North, allowed slavery to defile their own republic, while before the Negro mastered and sold without his concurrence, they boasted it the highest prerogative of the white-skinned laborer to sell himself and choose his own master. They were unable to attain the true freedom of labor or to support their European brethren in the struggle for emancipation. But this barrier to progress has been swept off by the Red Sea of Civil War. The Red Sea of Civil War. Imagine thinking that Abraham Lincoln, the president of America, could be a red. No. But the Civil War makes it impossible to continue thinking that slavery is okay. And that must be progress. The working men of Europe feel sure that as the American War of Independence initiated a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so it's a bourgeois revolution, right? So the American anti-slavery war will do for the working classes. They consider it an earnest of the epoch to come that it fell to the lot of Abraham Lincoln, the single-minded son of the working class, to lead his country through the matchless struggle for the rescue of an enriched race and the reconstruction of a social world. Unfortunately, Lincoln was not uh, of the working class. This was a bourgeois revolution. It put the owners of factories in the pole position as opposed to the owners of plantations, to so the slave-owning class, that's an improvement. Um, but the reconstruction that actually happened, the reconstruction of a social world, was not on the basis of working class power. It was a basis on, of, on the basis of the owners of capital and their power. In fact, you can read uh, how in the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, you can Black Reconstruction in America, you can uh, read an excellent, maybe one of the greatest books of sociology that America has produced. You can read about how the potential of what happened in the 10 years after the Civil War, after the, the um, slaves were freed, I would say even freed themselves. Yeah, go on. That 
that away. Please ask a question. You raise your hand. Okay, in the 10 years reconstruction, in the 10 years uh, reconstruction after the Civil War, the reconstruction didn't um, continue with the slaves being freed. It moved the slaves into wage labor at a lower level than white labor. I mean, the, the levels of education that were uh, implemented directly after um, the Civil War were impressive. New schools were started, education programs for blacks, etc., etc. but these did not last. These were slowly reconstructed out of existence. One should read W.E. Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois. I wrote down the name. But that, what, what did you want to say? Okay. So yeah, they the slave trade. That's something we should uh, never forget as a basis for. Well, look. Um, think about the documents. Revelations, the, the, the memory, memory and identity formation that we should keep in, in view when we think about the old slave system. For starters, these very buildings that surround the plinth in that discussion, all right? The buildings that I was pointing out around here, this gallery, uh, this uh, next to the plinth there, we've got uh, some embassies and so on. These are the very buildings that were produced at the height of an industrial revolution funded by money from slavery. Right, so this art is only possible on the top of monuments that were built by the slave trade. This era building is, is, is formative, is, is representative of, of the wealth that came to, to London on the back of basically slavery and then colonialism. And that's why I wanted to talk about memory in relation to art. Memory of this, this scenario, right? This, that in Marx's text, Africa had been turned into a warren for the hunting of black skins. And that that was what built the possibility of the bourgeois society that eventually has artists. I mean, all right, there was always slavery in, in, under Islam. It wasn't like the, the British invented slavery. It has a long history. You can read about it in, I know, normalized in the Thousand and One Nights, uh, harems and, and, and people uh, made, forced to join uh, armies of Nawabs in India or, or, or wherever, join as soldiers or be ship's crew. Um, general labor, slavery are, are tied up together. We're bonded labor for plantations, sure. But the, and, and the capturing of slaves wasn't necessarily done by white people. They bought the slaves off Muslim slave trader middlemen or, or so on. I mean, you can see here some of the sites, the forts that were built by the Europeans at the coast. They they were not about to be 
capturing slaves themselves, but they sent people out, right? So the slave trade is, is a core part of colonial trade. There's a triangle of weapons, slaves, and plantation products that, that move, right? Workers, potential workers, sold by the life into the plantations in South America and, and, and North America, South America first, uh, Caribbean, sugar plantations, and so on. And then the money sent back to Europe to fuel the, what became the Industrial Revolution. Well, first of all, to fuel colonialism in Asia. Without, without the money that was made from the colonization of South America and the slave trade in South America, the sugar money that came back to Europe and the silver, Europeans, and especially the English, could not have, have got into um, India in the way that they did. And to, to using the silver that they made from the sale of um, slaves in the Americas, they were able to buy possessions in Bengal and, and trade opium in Canton and the French too. Spanish first, the Dutch, then the French and the English. I visited some of the, the ports in, in Senegal, Gore Island and so on, where the slaves were, um, um, what's to say, they were um, stored, a bit like a marketplace. They were captured in the, in the rural areas, but they were brought to these coastal towns that the, the British and the French had set up, uh, and Spanish and Dutch. And, and kept in, in horrendous cell conditions before they were shipped out through this, this famous gate. This is actually a picture I took of the doorway through which so many of the slaves were shipped onto boats. I mean, they were taken from, the, from a, basically a prison cell, tiny cells in which like 20 and 30 people were in a, and jammed into a room for months and then the ship came along and they were dragged through this door and put onto the ships that pulled up alongside and taken across uh, what's called the Middle Passage, which is a very um, tame name for crossing the Atlantic during which like, millions and millions crossed the Atlantic and, and many, many died on the way and often if some got sick on the way, rather than have them infect the rest of the um, the uh, cargo of people, the the sick would be thrown overboard. Let alone piracy and, and exchange of and also, anyway. That story. Read the work of Marcus Redeker. Um, for this, uh, the companies that controlled the trade, the the, the, and then the kind of posturing that Britain made about uh, abolishing the slave trade but replacing it with, with bonded labor, labor, you know. Um, Marx's comments on Beatrice Stowe and Mrs. Sutherland are really interesting to see because he could see through it, the rhetoric of uh, anti-slavery in the so-called anti-slavers. Slavers. <sighs> I don't even have anything to say about these horrible conditions of a slave ship. You must have seen these, these images of people packed as cargo. And then um, some of these cargoes fought over in battles, but then sold in markets. And anyone who ran hung, lynching. Slavers would insure their cargo, however, insurance could not be brought against disease. On its way to Jamaica in 1781, the ship Zong was nearing the end of its voyage. It had been 12 weeks since it sailed from West African coast with its cargo of 417 slaves. Water was running out. In compounding the problem, there was an outbreak of disease. The ship's captain, wanting to minimize the owner's losses, threw any slave who was diseased overboard. The voyage was insured, but the insurance would not pay for six slaves or even those killed by illness. However, it would cover slaves lost by drowning. 
captain gave the order. 54 Africans were chained together then thrown overboard. Another 78 were drowned over the next two days. By the time the ship had reached Jamaica, 132 per persons had been murdered. This is marks on slavery all through capital, right? So turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, labor in the white skin can emancipate itself where it's branded in the black skin. The present Duchess of Sunderland entertained Mrs. Beatrice Snow, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, with great magnificence in London to show her sympathy for the Negro slaves, the American Republic, a sympathy that she prudently forgot with her fellow aristocrats during the Civil War in which every noble English heart beat for the slave owners. I gave in the New York Tribune the facts about the Sunderland slaves, Sutherland slaves, writes Marx, to expose the hypocrisy of this fine advocate of the Negroes. Recall that at the end of Chapter 6, the labourer had nothing to sell but her labour power and nothing to expect but a tanning on their skin, the branding of the skin. Piracy, slave trade, that whole period is the foundation of the imperial centre like London. It made possible the conceptual art of contemporary artists. Marx is the one that said, This is 11. The philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. So in a way, we can think about this in relation to art. Artists interpret the world, but they're not changing the ideology of the individual unless they are doing this kind of work that points to the collective nature of what should happen on those plinths, right? This is where the role of artists has some potential, perhaps. Perhaps, perhaps only, right? I'm thinking that some artists who use individualism to tell a story about collective memory are, are, are hinting at the beginnings, hinting at this story that needs to really work much more on memory the memory of what it was that built the plinth in the first place, that our cultural arts, so proud that uh, we are of the sophistication of having an art scene and, uh, and so on, is founded on, on the very bricks and mortar that made up a slave society. It needs to be a part of the story. I mean, some of those works are pointing that out. The first one I showed, Shola Yinki Shonaba, is pointing that out, the colonial ship in a way, but uh, asking a lot of viewers, I mean, many viewers just saw that ship and went, oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't he an individually great artist? When in fact, I think the reference is to a different kind of memory. At the same time, Sakari Douglas Camp's work that wasn't selected, the maquette of a collective protest, does indicate that something is there not to be forgotten, even in the center of the empire. Now, whether that amounts to a hill of beans, I don't know. But there's something um, potentially powerful in telling the story, at least, working on the collective 
appropriation of uh, a, a critique, I suppose, of, of the idea of subjectivity, of the individual heroic artist, to recognize that remembering how any individual is only possible as a social being, that social critique that's there in capital, uh, it has to be a part of any work that we do on mass media and culture for it to be worthwhile. He thinks, he says, it's up to you to make up your mind about it. Uh, Lynn, thank you for, yeah, um, W.E. Du Bois, an American and Ghanaian sociologist, socialist, historian, civil rights activist, pan-Africanist, author, writer, and editor, yeah. He was in America um, for, for a huge part of his career. At the end of it, he went to live in Ghana, and his library is still there in Ghana, uh, his, his collection of books. Um, and Gayachi Spivak, who I've no doubt talked to you about in a different class, is about to produce a, a book on his work, um, which I'm waiting, anticipating will be really good. I hope it comes soon. Okay, let's go to uh, discussion.